left alone in the office, it allows me to scour the internet with impunity. Some of the stories I read on the internet are quite compelling. Here's a cute one written by some kid. Hmm, it's too bad it's unfinished, but I guess I could read it anyway. It's entitled Lawrence the Medium. Once upon a time, there was a man named Lawrence. Lawrence was a world-renowned psychic and medium. He was an expert in all the tools of divination imaginable. The crystal ball, tarot cards, the I Ching, smoke scrying, tea leaf reading, palm reading, automatic writing, even the Ouija board. But what Lawrence really excelled at was conducting seances. He could conjure up any spirit he wished, a long-lost relative or friend. He could even conjure up demons and angels if he wanted to obtain more esoteric knowledge. Lawrence grew very wealthy over the years by his talents. He saw clients from all over the world and from all walks of life. Sometimes his wealthier clients would fly him to their estates for readings. These clients would include royalty, dignitaries, celebrities, politicians, and captains of industry. Lawrence would advise some of his clients what business decisions would be most lucrative for them. He would advise others as to what policies would be the most advantageous for their campaigns and terms in office. He even provided guidance as to which people would be most auspicious for their careers and their lives in general. And Lawrence was not at all shy about cautioning his clients which people should be avoided. One day, Lawrence received a call from a very wealthy woman who was recently widowed. She entreated Lawrence to come up to her estate via a private plane at his earliest opportunity. She said that her husband had recently passed away and left no will. She stated that if she had been the only person in his life, the money would all have gone to her. But he had three children, and they were all viciously fighting tooth and nail over the fortune. The woman wanted Lawrence to come up and perform a seance to bring her husband's spirit back so he could dictate how he wanted his fortune to be divided up. It was hoped that this would quell their bitter feuding. Lawrence agreed to this and began to pack. It was an unusual but not unheard of situation. It was a highly delicate situation to be certain, and Lawrence knew, through no small amount of experience, that even if by divine miracle her husband had come back to life, presented himself in front of his wife and children, and wrote the will in their presence, they would still bicker about the money and contest the will in court. Money does have a tendency to bring out the worst in people, after all. He also had a feeling that one or more of the family members would try and persuade him, via a hefty bribe, to manipulate a reading that would bow to their favor. This sort of thing happened on a handful of his consults, but Lawrence never once took a bribe. He only revealed what the spirits told him. He did have a reputation to uphold. Lawrence finished packing and took a short cab ride to the airport to the aircraft waiting for him. The plane was on the small side, but still very luxurious. Plush leather reclining seats and carpeting in neutral colors decorated the cabin along with a small bar, way too many televisions, a very impressive stereo system, and a large bathroom complete with a shower. The pilot was a grim-faced man and he spoke very little. He gave Lawrence a terse greeting, and then instructed the flight attendant to load his bag onto the plane. She did so wordlessly, but with a pleasant smile, and Lawrence followed her onto the plane while the pilot followed behind him to secure the door behind them all. The flight was uneventful. No turbulence to speak of, and very little in the way of conversation took place between Lawrence and the pilot or the flight attendant. Lawrence didn't really feel like talking anyway. He was feeling rather uneasy about this latest job, and the dream he had on the flight when he took a quick nap did nothing to calm his anxiety. He dreamt that the plane had violently crashed into an unspecified area of land. No one had survived, not even him, but his spirit was still free to roam the earth. When his spirit left the plane, he tried to see where he was, but he was surrounded by a very heavy fog. Visibility was virtually nil. 
The only thing that was somewhat visible was a narrow, bright red path. It was as red as blood, and it snaked uphill to an unknown destination. Lawrence followed this path for what seemed like hours to a large, stunningly beautiful manor house. It was at this point when an unknown force took control of his movements. Lawrence was taken through one of the walls of the house to a stately living room. It was resplendent in original artworks and antiques, very lavish but tasteful furniture, a grandiose silk rug and a massive chandelier in the very center of the room which could only be described as glorious. Sitting in the middle of the room on a regal-looking sofa was a petite, well-dressed, middle-aged woman reading a book. Her eyes were rimmed red as though she had been crying for some time. She was dressed in a white cashmere sweater and silk navy blue colored pants. She wore a long, delicate, multi-strand gold chain and small gold earrings. Her dark hair was shoulder length and impeccably styled. Not a single hair was out of place. She seemed almost willfully oblivious to the shouting that resonated from another room nearby. The unseen force then compelled Lawrence to enter the room in which the shouting was taking place. Three people, two young ladies and a young man, were arguing amongst one another about their father's money. It was then Lawrence perceived that he was having a vision about the family he was on his way to visit. Their fighting was as bitter as he was told. Much of their language, better left to the imagination than repeated, was borderline criminally belligerent. The unseen force then caused Lawrence to sink through the floor. He fell several feet before stopping inside a cavernous wine cellar. Lawrence was absolutely gobsmacked at what he saw. It looked as though every brand of wine, beer, liqueurs, champagnes, whiskies, and cognacs could be found there. The cellar seemed to go on for miles. Lawrence was then propelled forward to one of the near-infinite number of shelves that housed some of the near-infinite bottles of wine. He reached out and pulled out one of the bottles of red wine. The label that was supposed to be affixed to the bottle was very loose. Lawrence peeled off the label and noticed that behind it was a note written in green ink. It simply read this. Break this bottle open for the last will and testament of Mr. Anastas Carver. Lawrence did so. The red wine spilled everywhere. It seemed to flood the entire cellar. A plastic Ziploc bag containing some papers also fell to the floor. Lawrence perceived this to be the will, but before he could pick it up and read what it said, he woke up. This didn't bother Lawrence so much, but what did irk him was the fact that he could not remember exactly where in the wine cellar he found the bottle, and he did not catch the name of the wine that contained the will. And that's where the story ends. Oh well, I guess the ending is best left to the imagination.